John luckily had a, found a home in Goulburn last night and uh, arrived in Young this morning. And thank you to Alice, who's now arrived, for finding John and where he was. But John, I'm not going to use a script, because once again we read what he's done, but John is connected with Sydney University. But once again, John is out there promoting what we do. And as I say, we need the science, we need the uh, action of of getting it growing and showing people that it works. So I just believe over the last three days that we're drawing all of these people together. Um, and to give new people, there's a lot of new people here this time and you know, they've probably come with a bit of scepticism. I don't know quite what you're walking out with, but uh, I hope that we've eased some of that scepticism about what could be the, the fear of going into like new agriculture or changing agriculture. But I've got a joke, who's up for a joke? It's not that dirty. Okay, my sister told it to Costa because she saw the chook, knew about Kinky last night. There was a guy who was going into the movies and like Costa, instead of having a hen, he had a rooster. And he was carrying his rooster into the movies and the people at the theatre said, sorry, you know, we don't allow chooks into our theatre. You can't take it in. Oh, he said, but I have to. He comes everywhere with me. I can't put him down. I can't leave him outside. I want to see the movie. And no, it was a blanket no. They weren't going to change the rules or the authority. So he went into the gentleman's and he stuffed it down his pants and into his shirt. And so he walks into the movie and he, and he sits down and all comfortable, everything's okay. And about halfway through the movie, he thought he might be getting a bit suffocated down there. So he opened his fly. And beside him, there were two nuns, one either side. And they were nursing nuns from the hospital. And... The woman looked, so the head of the rooster pops out. And the nun looked across and went, oh my God, oh well, she said, we've, she said to the other nun, look, we've seen everything in nursing, you know, so there's nothing much that's new. And the other one said, yeah, but it's eating my popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a joke that Costa can take with him as he, he brings kinky everywhere that he goes. I'd like to introduce John, who is a, an inspiring speaker as well. And we'll draw some of what we've learnt together and what is looking for poos or kinky? <laughs> oh she's here still. We could have a demonstration of that joke but we both ask for that. <laughs> hey she likes young, she wants to stay at Milgadara. She slept in front of our fire last night, we didn't want to leave her in the car because it was quite cold last night so she slept in front of our fire. Kinky. He's your daddy. Yeah. <laughs> He's your daddy. <laughs> I, have you ever seen this happen before? Because she's always... Oh, yeah, because it's, it's, it's a great little world. Around there, she's... Oh, yeah, now you're in my world. Whereas when, I'm, when she's in my yeah. world, I do that over and she just goes... Whereas in her world, she's like... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well... So I could be here longer than I thought. <laughs> Catching kinky. Is there oh, a... a qu can imagine John, John going back to Sydney. Yeah, <laughs> well done. <laughs> Several times. So the last time we were together, it was called The Passion and the Professor. Yeah. And I got phoned up and said, we're doing this thing, it's called The Passion and the Professor. And I thought, oh, great, you know, because I'm quite passionate about what I do. <laughs> and they said, we're going to get Costa. <laughs> uh -huh, okay. Because he's going to be the passion and I was going to be the boring professor. <laughs> And it was, that was the second time that we'd done a, yeah. a duet, because previously we'd done a TEDx up and double. Mm. And, and I hate him because he's really good at communicating and presenting and everybody, and, and he, <laughs> he's brought a chicken. Mm. <laughs> so he's so it's like every again. time we meet, he ups the bar. <laughs> I've got to compete with a chicken. <laughs> well, I'll get her out of here so that we can, uh, you know, lower the bar. Well, no, no, it's too late. It's too, it's too late. <laughs> no, no, that, that we can level. We you, can level out. It's you've said it now, and it's recorded. <laughs> so we're going to lower the bar now for the next 15 or 20 minutes before coffee. <laughs> Um, so if you can put up with me for, you know, a short time. <laughs> so when John was missing last night, I said to anyone at the Federation, because the, the key was actually under room 208, that's what we were trying to relate to you, that where you could sleep. And I said, so if you see a Scottish guy walking around, he said, this morning, 
They don't know I'm Scottish while I'm walking around. They, they walk diagonally <laughs> once the bars close, you know. <laughs> well, that's a Scotsman staggering home after the bars close. I, was, I got the text, I was in um, Goldburn in bed, actually, <laughs> writing this talk because uh, I've been a wee bit busy, which is why, um, so we were going to have somebody else give the carbon presentation. Oh, oh yes, I must say I apologise. I've said it yeah, on day one. Yes, she needs to apologise. But for the <laughs> but for me, people who are day three, um, Petra was coming from Adelaide Uni. She had a lecture against seriously ill quite a few months ago. So she must have been very ill and she actually couldn't get away because um, she had to pick up her lectures. So I didn't know I was covering for for her until I arrived this morning. Oh. And it's all my fault, right? Because you did tell me that, you know, Petra's not going to make it. Could you do that? And I went, well, I'm a wee bit busy. I'll think about it. And, you know, are you desperate? And she sent back an email saying, uh, yes, I'm desperate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was one of those emails that didn't quite sink in. Look, anyway. a lecturer who speaks all day, when I tell him, you know, he's got... Well, now he's, he's actually like cost to take one of his whole sessions, nearly. Um, and now the morning tea's been brought out, so he's just wasted. He stole my time as well as <laughs> raised the bar. So he's, lit, he's dropped the bar of his own speaking time. <laughs> so do you actually want to we go to morning tea? So, no, no, the plan is um, I'm going to combine, because I can't talk about soil without talking about carbon, right? So you're going to get all that anyway, and it's going to be after tea. But I just wanted to quickly, you know, kind of talk a wee bit about quickly what we're doing at, at Sydney Uni, uh, just to follow up on this, this health thing, because I'm going to talk about health a wee bit in my talk as well. And, um, and this is kind of a new thing. It's actually the biggest single investment that the University of Sydney's ever made. And it's kind of where I'm, you know, I've been seconded into this centre. Uh, and it's about... It's about, um, it's about preventative health, and it's about diet, food. There it is. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, half a billion dollars. This is the university's bigger, uh, biggest, uh, oldest university in Australia, biggest ever investment in anything it's ever done because um, the future, like Costa said, wherever he's gone now, there he is, is about prevention, health, and the, and, and the future of agriculture and, and food production, the future of food, is to reposition food back where it used to be, which is, or actually, well, it hasn't been in, in Western uh, cultures, at least almost ever playing a central role in keeping us all healthy. We've forgotten that that's what food was for. And, and you know, you buy health foods, and you spend a lot of money, you go into pharmacy now if you want to be healthy, instead of the supermarket. And you pay a lot of money for health food, but food, if it's grown properly, is healthy anyway. And it's, you know, kind of what we've evolved to eat. Um, right, make this work. It's unique, it's exciting, and it's pan-university. So everybody, you know, if you eat, you're involved. Um, so it's looking at everything to do with preventative health, which is like the link between food production, environment, diet, lifestyle, and health. And all of those things conspire to keep us well, and it's not just physical health, of course, it's mental health, because the two are intimately related. Um, I'm just going to go through this quickly because I don't want to... This is a, one of those stock presentations that we all get to take with us. Um, so chronic disease is, is the leading cause of death in Australia, you know, heart stuff. So men, for some reason, women die of a lot more things than men. Uh, I, I'm not sure why that is. Like go to the doctor. <laughs> no, men don't go to doctors. So we just die and people think, oh, you just died. <laughs> Old age. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Heart disease, um, strokes, dementia. Did you know that, that um, Alzheimer's is, is now regarded as type 3 diabetes? It's the, the, the link to diet is that strong. 
colorectal cancer, diabetes, women pretty much the same, breast cancer, um, heart stuff, diabetes, colorectal cancer. Some people are genetically predisposed to a lot of this stuff, but a surprising, you know, maybe 40 or 50 percent of all cancers are diet related. And of course, nobody needs to, you, you can now, ch I was, uh, last weekend I was doing a thing somewhere with, with, it was all about, in fact, it was a conference for, for general practitioners about the link between diet and health. And I was, I met a, a surgeon, he's a, ca a colorectal uh, cancer surgeon, and, and he get up and give a talk. You have a choice not to have um, bowel cancer. It's a choice, and it's your diet. To a large extent, you can prevent colorectal cancer just by eating the right things. So these are, and of course, it's not just the, um, the tragedy that, you know, to, to your family and your friends and your loved ones when, when somebody gets one of these things and, and, and eventually dies. It's, it's uh, the impact on society is also phenomenal. So even if politicians are not interested, if your friends and family die, and they sure they are, um, they're very interested in the fact that if we continue with our lifestyle and eating like we do, uh, um, there is absolutely no chance that we can afford to be sick in about 30 years' time. Because the strain on, and I'll come to the figures in a minute, the strain on the health service is simply unsustainable. Um, and I think they all know that, but they're just not telling us and they're hoping that something magical will happen. Uh, and it won't unless we do something about it. And these are the figures. So currently diabetes is costing $4.1 billion in productivity loss and healthcare costs in Australia every year. Mental illness is 2.3 billion, cardiovascular disease 3.5 billion, cancers 3.3 billion, joint disorders, arthritis, things like that, hip joint replacement stuff, $4 billion. Now most of that, a lot of that, if it's not completely determined by your diet, diet can play a major role in improving the outcomes of these things. And if you look at how, what's going to happen by it, uh, in the next um, 20 years, we're going to see a five-fold increase in the costs of diabetes, three-and-a-half-fold increase in mental illness, joint disorders, two-and-a-quarter times, nearly double the expenditure on cancer. That is simply not affordable. There is no economic model for Australia that, that makes that affordable. So, this is the food system. This is the, all the factors that determine how food is produced, how nutrition comes from the soil into food and makes its way into society and impacts on our health. And this is a study done in the UK. It took four years and a whole bunch of people came together trying to figure out how we can reverse the trends in these health outcomes. Um, and some of it is... So you, you cannot disentangle production from demand, you know, the, 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 the food supply and food production from, from the demand. And on the right hand side we have the stuff, individual psychology, uh, physical activity environment, all the stuff that creates demand for food. And then on the left hand side we've got the food production, food consumption side. So, at the moment, when you guys produce food and sell it at the farm gate and it goes into coals or woolies usually and it gets changed and morphed into something that isn't really food anymore and then it causes you know and people demand that and and then at the same time of course there's huge pressures back on the farm to keep prices down you know milk is an unbelievable disaster just now same story you know keeping prices down because 
it doesn't matter about the quality of what we're getting. It just matters that, you know, a milk is milk is milk and, you know, a carrot is a carrot is a carrot. Well, that's not true, as we all know. It depends how it's grown and it depends what you do to it after it leaves the farm gate. So when you fill in all those little bubbles with stuff, these are all the factors that the, this, this group of people, in hundreds of people, over four years, came up. And the idea was they were hoping to find a solution and try and find a way of stopping us getting ill. And, all, and, and by their own admission, they failed because they, they produced a map, but they can't do anything with it because it's just too complicated. Despite the, well, you're not supposed to read it, you're just supposed to go, oh my God. Um, but the point is that no single intervention, there's no single magic bullet to this issue. And it requires a whole bunch of different approaches, like, you know, like Costa was talking about, about getting into schools and changing the way people think about food. I mean, so reconnecting. I used to think that um, community gardens and stuff in, in cities were kind of, you know, hmm, a bit sort of middle classy hippie stuff, you know. But actually, I think that if we can't reconnect cities to the country, and food is a great connector. And when people start growing their own, I mean, cities are never going to be self-sufficient in food, right? We're always going to need the rural farms and, and landscape to produce our food. But if people start to care about food, then they'll start voting with their dollars. And they'll start voting for change and caring about where the food comes from and how it's grown. So that's part of the story. I think this, the connecting uh, country and, and, and cities is, is, is a really important part. But there's a whole bunch of other things. So my role in, uh, I'm a bit of a numbers man, and, and um, I'll talk a bit about some of the stuff I'm doing after coffee. But my role in the Charles Perkins Center is to make sense and join this kind of, figure out what's going on here, and work with a whole bunch of interesting people from public health, agriculture, um, medicine and ecology and engineers and people who are interested in water, physicists, mathematicians and all those, try and see uh, if we can start to join up the picture and get a better understanding of how the whole system fits rather than just trying to find aimlessly just trying to tweak here and there which despite the enormous financial incentives globally to reverse diet related illnesses, um, we're still on a trajectory that's, that's, that's absolutely unsustainable. So, so I see, you know, and I, I sit on this ministerial um, panel, and I'm going to try and name the ministers that are on it. It's like naming the seven dwarfs, and I, I can never, so, um, Combe, Crean, Burke, and the Minister for Agriculture, <laughs> whose name I could, yeah. Ludwig, Ludwig. And we're, so this is a committee that's, that's trying to look at where the gaps are in, in research, extension, and, and uh, innovation in the, in the nexus, which is soil, water, and food, with, with the idea of creating a, a significant investment in that space over the next few decades to try and turn the whole system around. And during that process of coming up, trying to identify the gaps and figure out what we need to do, what was clear to me at least, and, and Costa mentioned this, you know, we're, we're losing uh, young people. You, we all know we're losing young people getting on the land, but we're, we're losing young people coming into to universities and TAFE. Uh, to learn about agriculture, to learn about the land. They're just not interested. So you talk to kids at school and say, are you interested in the environment? And they'll go, yes, I'm very interested in the environment. And they're thinking panda bears and gorillas and stuff. Um, when it comes to recruiting into agriculture faculties, 
it, it, all the numbers are, are, are in decline. It's not just Australia, it's globally. And if, if, if our faculty was run by a banker or an economist or an accountant, it would have been shut down. We're losing money hand over fist because of our declining student numbers. We're hugely successful in our research income, but the way research is funded in Australia, it makes a loss. You can only make a profit as a faculty if you've got enough students. So we're losing students. We are not clearly, obviously, going to be able to remain a faculty for indefinitely unless that situation changes. And then there's the whole, the whole way that research and innovation is organized in Australia. It's hugely fragmented. There's something well over 200 different agencies involved in managing research and innovation on the land, including water, food, and agriculture. And that's just insane. The idea that that money is being spent effectively and in a coordinated way is just demonstrably, uh, demonstrably false. So I would like to see, um, I would like to see us take food, agriculture, and the landscape as seriously as we take health in this country and in every other country. Um, it should be something that is owned by one person. So at the moment, we've got four or five ministers. So there wasn't even a health minister on this panel. That's the first question I asked when I arrived is, where's the health minister? Oh, well, we've got the food, the, uh, food plan, you know, and they're involved in that. And I'm thinking, okay, you're talking about food, soil and water, and you've not got the health minister. So there's a huge mis dis disconnection. And anyway, you can't have four or five portfolios managing such an important thing. It has to be one person owning that portfolio. And we've got a separate research council that funds innovation for medical research. Now, I used to head up in the UK the main funding committee for agriculture, but it wasn't just agriculture. It was agriculture, food, and nutrition. And I think that's exactly what we need. And the interesting thing was we used to get, we, we also had a medical research council, and, and, but we used to get applications coming in to, the, to our funding committee on, um, on stuff to do with what I th regarded should have been in medical research council. In other words, it was all about sickness. So, medical, so we decided that we would look at funding proposals if they were about health. And all the sickness would go into the Medical Research Council. So the idea that we've got a Health Research Council, we've actually got a Sickness Research Council in Australia, because that's where all these failures go. You know, I keep telling my medic, medic friends that they're, they're in the business of failure and I'm in the business of success, right? The business of prevention. And, and they have to deal with all the failures and, and we'll try and... So why don't we have a separate entity like the Medical Research Council for Agriculture and Food? and health and nutrition. That's what I would like to see in Australia. So I'm going to let you go and have your coffee now and then we'll come back after that and I'm going to talk about soil and I'm going to talk about diet and health of the soil because just like us the soil is more or less healthy depending on what we feed it and we don't want a big fat obese diabetic soil um, which, is what, which is what we can have if we don't manage it correctly and overuse of chemicals and stuff. So I'm going to talk about soil, health, and human health, and uh, carbon. And I'm going to mention compost because you know what she's like. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you in about, uh, what, 25 minutes? Yeah, about 20 minutes. So it's going very well so far this morning. Um, Cost has told me that I'm lowering the bar, and I just had a filmmaker tell me that I don't look as handsome as I do look in the picture. Where is she? Left the room just as well. I'm just a little bit older. Um, so I was at a meeting yesterday talking to um, a whole bunch of people. It was a meeting on an emerging infectious disease. And the reason that I was there was because, of course, the nutrition that we get from soil is important in, in keeping a strong immune system. And lots of places around the world, and probably here in Australia as well, we don't get 
everything that we need from the soil, and that has consequences for epidemics like HIV and things like that in, in Africa and China. Anyway, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, oh, I'd really like to talk, it's all about soil, that's great, I'm a keen gardener. Tell me, what is soil? And my head melted. Because it's actually very difficult. Um, it's like saying, what is a person, you know? It's lots and lots of different things coming together, and every soil has its own personality. There she is. There you are. You were the person that said I didn't look. <laughs> Not as as didn't look as handsome as I did in my picture. Well, I, I couldn't see you. I so, it's okay. No, it's all right. <laughs> Thank you. And so does my wife. And she can still say it without laughing, <laughs> unlike you. <laughs> uh, so what soil? So this is what soil is. Um, oh my goodness! It's a very tiny piece of soil, and it's we we made this image using high resolution X-ray microtomography. You know, like on these medical. Docu films like ER and stuff like that, which I really like. When anybody ever comes into hospital with something wrong with them, they get whisked off for a CT, because magically that diagnoses the problem. So we do the same with soil. If it, to 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 look at the health of soil, we 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 stick it in a CT because we the last thing we want to do is disturb the soil in any way in the analysis that we do because we we look on soil as an ecosystem. So it's a bit like Imagining you can understand orangutans by taking them out the rainforest and sticking them in red fern. On community garden. Or in a community garden, yeah. Um, so it's um, incredibly, we, we all know that soil is incredibly complicated, right? And, and we all know that it supports all of terrestrial life and we're probably, the people here are probably well aware that soil is, is being degraded and it's being degraded to the extent that something like 40% of the world's soil are either degraded or severely degraded and severely degraded means 70% of the top soil is already gone. <laughs> now there's various um, studies being done on how quickly topsoil is disappearing and it's quite hard to get the numbers actually surprisingly we don't routinely measure it you know we, we like to know what's coming into our bank account and what's coming out but we don't routinely measure what's coming into our topsoil and what's leaving our properties um, so if you take some average numbers and work it all out globally there's about 50 uh, well it's do the calculation, it says about 50 years, and that's an order of magnitude, right? It, it might, what it means is it's not never, it's not infinity, right? So soil is being lost, and where, where the studies have been done accurately, even when where conservation agriculture is being used, the rate of loss of soil is between four and 40 times the rate at which it's being replaced by natural processes. Um, and in China, it's, it's, it's nearer 50%, and they're talking in China, so I, w I was in Beijing about uh, six months ago, talking to some people from the Ministry of Water, and they were saying that if they do nothing about their soil problems in China, their wheat crop will decline by 40% in the next 20 years. Now, they grow a lot of wheat in China. A 40% decline in, in wheat production is phenomenal. Globally, the estimates are that the soil's capacity to produce food will decline by about 30% in the next 20 to 50 years as a result of degradation of soil. Now that's in the context of having to produce, you know, depending on who you believe, between 50% and 100% more food in the same time to feed 2 billion more people 
And it's not just two billion more people because these are people who are getting wealthier and their diets are changing and they're consuming a whole bunch of different stuff and that's placing even more pressure on the land. Against declining availability of water and all, the all of the trajectories associated with supply completely go in the opposite direction of those associated with demand. And governments around the world are now looking at our capacity to feed ourselves and, and mapping the capacity to feed ourselves based on, uh, to, to, to predict where the next conflicts are going to happen. And the, the uh, Arab Spring is an example, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, uh, as always, with when you, never as simple as just cause and effect, right? There were circumstances that arose in Egypt that made the, the society and they are rather unstable, and it just needed something to to push it over. And that something was rising food prices in 2007-2008. And wheat in particular, which uh, Egypt depends almost 100% on wheat imports, and when the price goes up, people get hungry, and when people get hungry, they've got nothing to lose, and they get a bit desperate, and stuff happens. And some people are even attributing the sporadic little sparks of, of uh, unrest associated with this um, stupid American film on, uh, that supposedly mocks Islam that some of that violence is actually associated with food insecurity and desperate people who are already on the edge and just need this something to just to tip over what is already a fragile social um, fabric. So we're beginning to see the evidence around the world of issues associated with uh, our ability to feed ourselves. Now, in, so we're, when and I was at a food security meeting a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago down in Melbourne, and the Craig Emerson uh, was there talking and talking about the opportunities for Australia. And it's true, Australia will never have a food security problem unless we do something really stupid. But we have a food security problem in the sense that just about 50 kilometres north of the country, we have 250 million people in Indonesia, who are rapidly Im improving their lifestyle and, and are becoming richer and are changing their demands for food. And it's in our interest to be able to continue to supply food to our neighbours to maintain that stability. And you know, So it is actually a food security issue. Not no, it's not about whether Australia can feed itself or not. It's about can we realise the opportunities that there are, and how Australia is probably, amongst all nations on the planet, the most perfectly positioned to benefit from these challenges that we face if we decide to do it. And it comes back to that stuff I was talking about, how we fund things to do with innovation and how we in, in, uh, seduce young people into to, you know, tomorrow's innovators, and how we sell knowledge, and how we sell our food. Um, so that's why we care about soil. Now, soil is absolutely hooching with life. These are some uh, little thin sections you can make of soil, like in soil histology, where, where you take a little slice of soil you, and you, you, you put stuff in it that make the microbes glow in the dark. And then you can see them under a microscope, because funnily enough, Usually when people do soil biology, they take all the biology out of the soil and you study the living things. Just imagine that the rest is dirt, right? So what, what we were trying to do was understand where the biology is in its natural habitat, where the orangutans, what orangutans do when they're in the forest. And you can see this little clump of, is there one of these laser things? The middle button. Ooh, there. Um, little cluster of bacterial cells in the middle of soil. And then here's the pore space, this milky white stuff. This pore space, just because of the way the soil's prepared, it looks white. Um, 
So if you were a microbe sitting in the middle of soil, it matters a lot that you're there and not on the edge of a pore for what you do. Oh my goodness, what have I done? So here is fungi. That's oh, not very good at this. This is a worm cast, and you can see there's a hell of a lot more microbes around here because there's food resources. So you hold a little piece of soil in your hand, you'll have 20 square meters of surface area because biology is great at packing surfaces into lots of surface into small volumes. You know the story about your lungs or two tennis courts or something like that. Soil's the same, lots of surface area, small volume, but most of it is uninhabitable. Uh, but, you know, you get these kind of hot spots and oases where the microbes flourish. And this is with the fungi, and I'll come back to the fungi because I'm very passionate about fungi. And they do good stuff in the soil that we all depend on. And I think the following presentation is also going to talk about fungi, which is nice. And we've no idea what this is. Uh, something from Mars. It looks like a, some kind of gut of something. Hmm? Not the accordion of humus. The accordion of humus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's a humus accordion, I don't know. The, if you take all of the life out of soil, because you can't see it, you, you, you forget it's there. Or, but if you take it all out, all of that meat, all of the biomass, microbial biomass, if you took it out from below the soil, put it above the soil and made it into sheep, you would have something like a hundred, even in a modest soil, you would have a hundred sheep per hectare, equivalent in, in mass of, of wobbly living stuff. Um, a very good, well looked after grassland could be 2,000 sheep per hectare. So most of the living stuff on your farm is below the ground in the soil. And what, what farmers, good farmers do, which I'm sure you all are, is feed that. That's what you're farming. And the other stuff just happens as a result. What's the black sheep? Oh. That, that is biochar. <laughs> no, it's not. It's just a black sheep. <laughs> black carbon. Black carbon. Um, Now, this is, I've called this the most important graph in ecology. Uh, it's, it's, it's a graph of, of moisture content up on the vertical axis there versus, it's actually pressure on the horizontal axis, but what, what I've done is I've, I've, draw, I've converted that into the size of the pores that are drained at that pressure. So, so at this pressure down here, the biggest pores 150 microns start to be drained. And actually, gravity will drain those kind of pores. And the, the moisture content, as the water leaves those pores, the water content in the soil drops down, and you have to suck harder and harder to get the water out of the smaller and smaller pores, because soil is, uh, water is sticky stuff. And most of the action in, in the field happens round about here. So we're talking about structures less than 50 microns. So the tiny, tiny uh, structures in soil of the order of the size of microbes, in other words, the kind of uh, the habitat of the microorganisms is the same stuff, that is the same structure that holds water in soil. Now, an interesting uh, statistic, the sea level has risen, I forget the number now, since 1960 it's risen quite, quite a lot. Uh, a few millimetres per year on average. That doesn't sound a lot, but it's a lot if you multiply it by 50 years. Um, a third of that sea level rise is due to irrigation water that didn't get into the plant. So you put it on the soil and it passes down through the soil. It isn't, the structure isn't there to hold that water in the profile. It just bypasses the whole agricultural system and goes out to sea. We're filling up the sea with 
water that is probably our most scarce resource on the planet and we're just uh, so what found filling. From the ground, ground water irrigation water from groundwater, hmm. from lakes, from dams. Yeah, yeah, mostly from groundwater, yeah. It's amazing. Uh, so those aquifers are being emptied into the ocean. Um, now, a good soil will have a nice broad curve here so that over a very broad range of conditions there'll still be water in it and actually there'll be a good mixture of air and water because you need air and water in soil. All forms of life need air and water. Microbes are, are, uh, are no different and their activity is significantly higher if there's oxygen present than if there isn't. And that's what makes soil, that's basically why soil is such a great thing because it allows the coexistence of air and water over a very broad range of conditions and therefore is able to support all this life, all those 2,000 sheep below the ground per hectare. And the relative proportion of air and water is a very important factor determining the, what the microbes do in soil. And all of the, rate, the rates at which things happen, like uh, carbon is released or uh, nutrient recycling turnover, all of those rates are controlled by how much water and how much oxygen there is. So that's a really important curve. Now, this is a little fly-through thing. Um, it's it's high-resolution X-ray tomography again of soil, but this time my PhD student, who spends far too much time in front of computer games, <laughs> took the images and textured them and made a fly-through. So you could actually, this is if you were a microbe, this is the world that you'd see. So all of these structures are less than most of them are less than 50 microns. These are the structures that hold water. And what do you notice about them? Well, there's no water, Alistair. Who said that? <laughs> there's no water because uh, uh, for technical reasons, it's quite hard to image water at the same time as soil. You, you can fly through it. Now, if, yeah, if this was a random structure, if it was just a random packing of particles, but packing problems are very interesting problems. Walter Raleigh asked, the Royal, he was trying to pack as many cannonballs into his warships as possible for obvious reasons. So he asked the Royal Society, what's the most efficient way to do it? And they went, Ehh. So that problem was solved in 1999. <laughs> Very hard, these kind of things. But, so we know a bit about packing and stuff. If this was a random, if soil was a random structure, you couldn't fly through it. This is about 15% porosity. A random structure packed at 15% porosity is impenetrable. But soil's not like that. It's highly connected. These tiny little channels and pores and things join up. Uh, and that's just as well, because these are the pipes and channels in which water moves and air moves into the soil, into the microbes, and from the microbes into the plant. And so the connectivity of the structure is a really important feature. No, that, that is uh, the kind of stuff you'd scrape out from under your fingernail. It's about a mil uh, half a millimetre, probably. But these are the structures. This is the habitat that the microbes live in. This is the structure that does all the function. All the bigger cracks and things, the water just passes straight through those. This is what holds water. This is what makes your soil fertile. It provides the habitat for the microbes. If that structure at that scale is not good, your soil won't function. And is it looking for food there? You know, as, as it does that, is that it searching for, you know, I don't know, some calcium and some... You know? Well, if you, were, if you were a microbe, which you've obviously become whilst you were watching that, yeah, you, so some microbes are mobile and some are not, and, and uh, so we, we actually made a game out of this, not this version, the previous one, we did something, uh, 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 was it Frontier, Royal Society Frontiers and Science Exhibition, it was in Edinburgh, of all places, and uh, we had a joystick and you could fly, and this was to show kids how complicated the 
soil is and how important the structure is. If you, so they had to imagine being a microbe and they had to find bacteria to eat. And so we hid the bacteria in the place and and the, the resounding comment, I mean, with loads of kids, it was great. It was a great way to engage kids with soil. But they were so disappointed you couldn't blow up the, oh. <laughs> the bacteria. So version 1.1 will have exploding bacteria. So it, soil is organized. In fact, you can describe it mathematically. And this is a mathematical... Mm, cost has taken the battery out of this as well. <laughs> Um, Is it gone again? Oh, yep. you're not pointed at the right thing. No, 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 no. See? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm paranoid about him now. Is he still here? <laughs> he's gone. He's scared. Uh, yeah, so this thing down on... It's just a, that's a mathematical shape. You can describe that with one number. Or two numbers, actually. So al although it looks very complicated, it's actually very simple. And... But it's organized. And when I first did this, and it was a long time ago, I looked much younger and more handsome. Uh, I, the first thing that came to my mind, because I didn't know much about soil then, still don't know much about soil, um, wh where does that organization come from? Because it's so important. These are the structures that determine everything about soil. And it's organized. Who's organizing it? Now, it's been known for a long time. Judy Tisdale and Malcolm Oates in Australia came up with this idea that microbes affect the physical structure of soil. So if you've got a lot of fungi, for example, you, you get big, and you, and you pick soil up and you break it up, you get bigger chunks if there's a lot of fungi in it than, than if there isn't. And the reason for that is that microbes do stuff when they're in soil. And I'll show later that it's not an accident that they do this. But in proportion to their activity, microbes stabilize the structure in the local environment. And they do it by releasing kind of sticky, long-chain carbon molecules and things into the soil. Carbon from the microbes into the soil. And fungal, fungal hyphae, physical enmeshment, but they also release stuff into the soil. That's how fungi eat. They, they, they release stuff that dissolves organic matter so it can diffuse in through the membrane. Um, so microbes are able to locally stabilize the structure in soil. And they do it in proportion to their activity. So if they're in a happy place, they're going to be doing a lot of local reinforcing just because they're happy, right? That's what they do. And if they're not in a happy place, that, there is a lot less reinforcing going on. Well, they probably go straight to survival mode or something. Yeah. Yeah, and you get some bacteria which actually even shed their DNA to, to reduce the metabolic load of, of, of repairing, self-repair, just so they can use as little energy as possible and stand there and wait for millennia for their dinner. I'm very patient. So the question is, okay, we know that microbes change the structure, but surprisingly, nobody asked the question, well, does the structure then, do those changes in structure affect the microbes? Because if they do, then you've got some kind of loop happening. And it's no longer the case that you can say that microbes are affecting structure, a cause effect. Because now we've got a feedback loop. So microbes affect structure, but structure affects microbes. And you've got this. And in physics and things, we like those kind of feedbacks because that drives a dynamic system. So when you've got microbes change structure, that's a static thing. The microbes, they change the structure, and that's it. When you've got feedback, the potential for the changes in structure to affect the microbes means you could have very interesting behavior. And we wondered if this is where the organization comes from. So we did a very simple, it's a bit like a computer game, to be honest. We call it simulation. And mathematical modeling, but actually we're having a great old time making things on computers and playing. 
Um, so we constructed an artificial soil in the computer that had microbes in it. And um, we simulated a bunch of different processes. So you've got the physical architecture. That affects diffusion. And you can simulate where the, if, if this is, this is uh, again, a CT image of soil. But this time we've, we've used computers to calculate where the oxygen goes if you've got microbes breathing. So if you're a microbe in a cave with the door shut and you breathe, eventually you use up all the oxygen in that cave and it becomes anoxic or oxygen free. And this is what's happening here. There's a little microbe there in a cave or probably a bunch of them. And, and, they've, and sim similar here. So there's lots of little caves, but a surprising amount of, this, of the volume is actually connected. Um, but you get this variation in activity, even across a very small, in this case, uh, half a millimeter piece of soil, a very wide range of different microenvironments that will affect the physical, the, sorry, the biological activity in a, in a similarly complex way. So that's the oxygen moves around. What's the consequences for biology? Well, we um, imagine that oxygen is consumed. So you get lots of oxygen and it, it's consumed. Some of that oxygen gets converted through metabolism into some kind of stabilizing agent. And we still don't really know what that is. It could be biomass. It could be this extracellular polysaccharide EPS the sticky glue stuff that's made of carbon, which can also decay. So you, the oxygen moves around, the microbes locally reinforce their environment in proportion to their activity. And then something happens in soil, like it dries or it wets. Soil is all the time being perturbed, mostly through wetting and drying, and that causes physical rearrangement of particles. But that physical rearrangement is now no longer a random rearrangement because this, the, this, the, the locations in soil that are preferentially reinforced will be less likely to rearrange. And the ones that are less strongly reinforced will be more likely to be arranged. So all the good sites in soil stick around, literally, whereas all the, all the less beneficial, all the less um, suitable microbial habitats have a higher probability of being disrupted. Oh, that's just some detail which we don't need. So this is what the computer soil, the in silico soil, predicted. So along here we've got time and then on the horizontal axis we've got the connected porosity. So you remember feature of that fly-through was how connected the pore space was. And we started off with a random structure which had zero connected porosity. Because random structures do, unless they've got a very high porosity to start with, their connected porosity is zero. So it started off as zero, but what we found was after a fairly short time, the, co the pore space starts to connect up. And then it kind of levels off. So the, 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 the fact that you've got this feedback between microbes affecting structure and structure affecting the local microbial activity, and then the reinforcement of sites in soil, causes the soil to organize. And it causes it to organize in a way that's good for microbes. <gasps> so when, when my students, when that happens with my students, I get their phone and, and I phone their mum. <laughs> I could phone I could I could phone you and you could give him a row. That's what happens when you give him the phone for ten minutes. <laughs> now there are three curves on there for those perceptive members of the audience. And what we see with the, these other curves is that they start organizing a bit later and the connected porosity at the end is less. Now the difference between those curves is the starting porosity, in other words, compaction of the soil. Just for no, I've been watching you go down through. So if you can maintain enough soil, uh, enough water in your soil, 
for a longer period of time, you'll actually get a better organisation. Is that right? Yeah, so, so it's not so much the wa well, water is part of it, but the microbes, yeah. microbial activity. <laughs> Yeah, the, the microbes, I mean, so the microbes need water and, and oxygen and they need that nice mix. But you see, the nice thing about this is that even if it's a wee bit off, so long as there's enough life, give it enough time, it will organise it back. So the, the microbes will fix your... The, the hypothesis, right, you know, this is... We've got to do a lot of work to do to, to really understand the generality of the conclusion here, but, but at least... A, con a conclusion that you might draw from this, a hypothesis that you might draw from this to test, would be that that this interaction between microbes and physical particle rearrangement in soil may be the basis for maintaining good structure in soil. And so if you want good structure in terms of holding water and active microbial community turning over nutrients and connecting that water to plants, Microbes will do it for you. Just be nice to your microbes. Mm. And I'll show you some things that you probably shouldn't do, which you all know anyway, if you want that to happen. So this is an example. These are thin sections this time. Not, well, they're actually it's CT images, but we've just taken a cross section. And on, on this side here, these two are sterile. So we, we took the soil and double gamma radiated it. And the gamma radiation just uh, uh, breaks up DNA and kills everything pretty much. But we had to do it twice because soil, <laughs> soil microbes are pretty robust. Um, on the right hand side we've got non-sterile soils. These are so soils with bugs in them. Now we, we used um, again a computer to simulate the flow of water to calculate the hydraulic conductivity of these um, pieces of soil. And these are the numbers here. Um, and you can see that, that the difference between the sterile and the non-sterile can be many, many orders of magnitude, hundreds, thousands of difference. A uh, very small scale, of course, but that's the scale that matter for things like plant roots and especially for less mobile nutrients um, and, uh, and for the, the microbes. So we've now got very good evidence that yes, microbes change structure and my goodness, the change in structure has a major impact on transport processes of relevance to microbial activity. So we've got this feedback. I'm pretty confident that this feedback loop does operate. The, 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 the importance of finding the feedback loop is that it becomes exponential then rather than... It becomes a dynamic thing. It becomes a dynamic state. So you've got the feedback correcting all the time. So if you... Um, compact the soil or something, let's say, or, or you know, the, the soil is a hell of a lot of rain or something, the soil structure gets disturbed. Through time, the soil will evolve back to a state that somehow maximizes the potential microbial activity in the soil. Because actually microbes have been doing this for a long time. They're not, they've, they've evolved an intelligence and it's not, you know, in, in, a, in a broad sense, the word, I use the word intelligence. They've, they've evolved the capacity to adapt their environment to, to, work to their own benefit. So microbes are not doing this so that you can grow plants. Microbes are doing this so you can feed them with plants. And, and plants grow. And because, of course, where the microbes get the carbon from is from dead plant material, but also from the roots. Uh, so plants give out about 20% of the photosynthes photosynthate out through the roots. They just bleed it out into the soil. They're feeding the microbes. The microbes, in return, give plants good soil and nutrients. And these changes, so this is now not a computer, this is measurement. We measured the soil, uh, although so it's not completely, it's a very simple thing because to try and show something convincingly, you have to make the system relatively simple and only change one thing, right? And I'll show you something that's a bit more realistic in a minute. So what we did was we irradiated the soil, we killed everything, double gamma irradiated it, killed all the living things in it, and then and that's sterile soil here. And then we added a species of bacteria, which we knew gave out a lot of extracellular polysaccharide. 
and we in, and, and on a second set of, of uh, microcosms, we, we introduced a fungus, one fungus, so a very, very simple system of soil and one species of microbe. And then we incubated it for three weeks, and the porosity changed. So you can see the starting porosity was around about 8%. Interestingly, the, with the bacteria that species that we chose and the, and the way we did this thing, we saw no difference uh, due to bacteria, but we saw a massive difference due to fungi. You know, it's nearly 50% more porosity. Now, the other interesting and important thing is that we did this twice, we, or rather we did the imaging twice. So we imaged, first of all, at a low resolution, 70 microns, and we didn't see any difference, and we thought, damn, damn, this is all wrong. And then we dropped the resolution to 9 microns, which at that time was the best we could do. And we saw the difference. In other words, the differences are happening at scales less than 70 microns and probably less than 50 microns. The mic so these, this porosity that's been created has been created, and it's the very, very fine scale porosity, the porosity that matters for holding water and for connecting things up and all the good stuff that you need in soil. The microbes are changing at that scale. And it's not surprising because if you're going to be a microbe and you're going to change things, you change it at the scale that matters for you. It turns out that it also matters for plants. So this is a slightly more realistic system in that it's got field soil in it. And then we did a terrible thing. We, um, again, we double gamma rated, gamma irradiated soils. We sterilized soil and we added, we mixed in bits of field soil. And the idea there was that we were trying to dilute the biodiversity. So we're manipulating the community to see if the, if the microbial community in soil affected this ability to do this organization. So by sequentially diluting the field soil with sterile soil, all the rare stuff got diluted out and only the most common things remained. And as you continued to dilute, only the very common things were left. And, and here we've got a plot of bacterial diversity as a function of dilution. So the dilution factor went from one part field soil to 100 parts sterile down to one part field soil to 10 to the 10. That's one with 10 zeros after it, sterile soil. So it's almost homeopathic. Very, very highly diluted soil. We did that dilution and then we incubated it for a year because we wanted the biomass to recover. And the biomass did recover, so the biomass was the same irrespective of the dilution, but what was different was the diversity. So this is bacterial diversity as a function of dilution, and you can see that as we progressively diluted, the diversity dropped. Not hugely convinced we know why this went up, although it's not statistically significantly higher. Now, the interesting thing with, with fungi was that that didn't happen. Fungi just hated the experiment. <laughs> so as soon as we did anything, the diversity crashed and, and it stayed the same irrespective of the dilution. Now the interesting thing there is that that, had an, that inadvertently affected the ratio of fungi to bacteria in the system. So this is a, a plot of the ratio of fungi to bacteria versus the dilution. And what you can see is that there are more fungi, as we go more and more dilute, there are more fungi. And we think that's because there's less competition with bacteria, because the bacteria community is much more compromised, progressively compromised as you, as you increase the dilution. And that gives fungi the edge. And so they're able to do better in the more dilute soils. But then, if you look at the porosity of the soil, so we did the same thing, you know, we mixed the soil, we, we left it for 20 days. Um, in this experiment, I think we included one wet dry cycle. And we got, so there's field soil, and here is the porosity of the other soils, the diluted soils, pretty much following the pattern of the 
fungi to bacteria. Again, strengthen, strengthening this idea that the fu it's the fungi that are quite important, or the most important agent in doing this reorganization. How am I doing for time? I've not been counting. Now, we're working with some people in Paris because Paris is such a nice place. <laughs> oh, oh, oh and, and of course, scientifically, it's very important um, that we do this experiment with them. It's the École Supérieure in Paris, and they've got this long-term experiment where they've compared conventional organic and zero-till. And we thought, this is a great opportunity to have a wee route around in the soil and see if you can tell the effect of management, this kind of management on this tiny fine scale architecture that you couldn't possibly see unless you use the X-ray tomography. So we did some stuff, sampled at two different depths, and the, the, the gist of it is, so here's conventional, uh, 3D and cross-section, organic, 3D and cross-section, and zero till, 3D and cross-section. If you were a microbe, which one of those would you rather have? No till. Can anybody imagine why no till is so good? Not breaking up the what? The fungi. The fungi. Fungi hate but they them being ploughed. Yeah. Zero till is great. And I'm sure most of you are doing that. Oh, just to be close up in case you can't see properly. Very different structures. Now, the, the other interesting thing is that, so this is, um, we, we f from the CT images, and this is, remember, this is the very fine scale architecture that you couldn't possibly see. This is the architecture that matters for holding water and, and, and oxygen in your soil. So we took those images and we calculated uh, porosity connected porosity, and alongside that, the, the people in France were measuring carbon content and nitrogen content of each sample that we measured, that we did the CT for. And then we just ranked them from the highest to lowest, or lowest to highest, lowest to highest. And there are three colors here, and the only one that you need to know about is the red color. And if you're colorblind, that's this one. Um, because that's zero till. The higher porosity, Higher connected porosity, higher carbon, and uh, at least at the high end, it's got higher nitrogen content. So we were a bit surprised that there wasn't much difference between the organic and the conventional, um, but zero till just blows them all away. Here's another example. This is a pasture that's had some lucerne in it. And lucerne's great because it fixes nitrogen increases the theory is and the, and the practice is that it increases the productivity of the pasture and it pumps carbon into the system because it pumps nitrogen into the system. So on the left here we've got 50 tonnes per hectare, on the right here we've got 80 tonnes per hectare and um, simulating, again using computer modelling to simulate the flow of water movement of water through those structures. This is the lower carbon version, and this is the higher carbon version. And the higher carbon version just got more water everywhere because of this fine scale architecture linking stuff up. So where are we going next with this? Um, I just love fungi, right? And I know they're important for soil, but that's not why I'm doing it. I'm just doing it because they're hugely interesting. And by the way, they're also important for soil. And so we've been playing around for about 10 years now, trying to see if we can model, and I don't mean model, I mean understand where the organization and fungi come from, because fungi are actually highly organized things. We've done similar measurements on those, and we find that they don't grow randomly. They're very clever in the way that they move around. And following the philosophy that you don't understand something unless you can, in, until you make it. So we try to make fungi in the computer. And we can now, r with a very simple model, um, very few processes, 
we can reproduce, observe, so this is one fungi versus another fungi, and this is our computer model of it. Um, this is a single fungi, you see these rings. If you grow fungi in a dish, invariably they produce these concentric rings. Uh, we, th it turns out that that's just due to, to the way that, that, that fungi recycle internally, recycle their biomass and shift stuff around. So we're reasonably confident that we've got a model for fungi that is reasonably accurate. Now, the reason why we want to do that is because if fungi are the agents that are responsible for binding soil particles, then we need to understand a little bit more about how they move through soil. Uh, this is a simple packed sphere shape, uh, and we've got the, the fungal model growing. Now, the green stuff is is organic matter or something, you know, something with, nutri with, with resource in it. And this allows us to see the preferential reinforcement that happens as a consequence of where the nutrition is in soil. What we're trying to move towards is an understanding of the link between diet and health for soil. So can you use nutritional interventions to make soil healthy in the same way you can people? And we were literally, and we are now literally, u testing the same human nutrition model that's now accepted. People accept that the ratio of carbo protein to carbohydrate in the diet is an important factor in weight gain and weight loss. So we wondered, is, is that is the same true for fungi? And for protein, read nitrogen, and for carbon, carbohydrate, read carbon. So carbon to nitrogen, how important is carbon to nitrogen? And how important is the source of nitrogen, organic or inorganic, for fungi? Oh my goodness. Right, so no, I'm not going to do that because there's no time. It's just a bit cool, that's all. Dietary interventions for soil. Now, the interesting thing was, and that's completely invisible. I apologize for that. Maybe I, can, I should be able to zoom in using this magic thing. Just so you can see one of the curves. When we measure the rate of growth, mm, it fights back. See those curves? Along the bottom there is time on the graph. There's time, and up here is dry weight of fungus. So we grew, the, and, and, and up here are different ratios of protein to carbohydrate. Depend, and, and actually the carbohydrate was glucose, and the protein was, was glucosamine, or, which is organic, or ammonium, which is not. We found oscillations in the growth of fungi. So they, there's some instability in the way these fungi grow over time. Now, whenever I see oscillations, because I'm a physicist, right, and a bit weird, whenever you see an oscillation, that's telling you there's some regulation going on, because something's gone up, and then it's been regulated down, and then it's been regulated back up, and it's a bit of over-regulation because it's oscillating really. You, that's a system that's trying to find an equilibrium, but it's overshooting above and below. So that's telling you there's something about the way that nitrogen and carbon are interacting in delivering growth. And it was a little clue for us to start looking. This is organic nitrogen, and, and you can't see the difference, but you'll see the difference here. This is a graph of how big are those oscillations, and how does the instability, the size of the instability, those, how does, that, does the amplitude of those oscillations change with the quality of the nutrition? And quality is measured as the glucose carbon to nitrogen ratio for glutamine, which is an organic source, or um, ammonium chloride in this case, ammonium, which is an inorganic source. And what we found was the inorganic source, we found an increased instability as we increased the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So some, as you're feeding, because so carbon is the energy source, right? As you give the thing more carbon, you're driving it harder, and it's becoming more unstable. But only for the inorganic form 
of nitrogen. For the organic form of nitrogen, there's no relationship, no significant relationship. So there's something qualitatively different about the way that, that the fungi that we're looking at here metabolizes carbon and nitrogen, and it's different from humans. Humans have a, so you'd be a f fat human up here, you know, with a high carbohydrate, low protein is the worst kind of diet you can have. It, you, you gain weight, most people gain weight with that kind of diet. Fungi have this amazing capacity to just keep on going, and it's because they do clever stuff with nitrogen, which we don't as humans do. At least, yeah, no, we don't. Um, where am I going with this now? Oh, yeah. Now, this is total carbon to nitrogen ratio. So this is counting up the number of carbon atoms, counting up the number of nitrogen atoms, dividing one by the other. And this is growth rate. And it turns out that irrespective of organic or inorganic sources for this species of fungus, and it's just one species, right? There's really no difference. There is a trend that as you increase the carbon to nitrogen ratio, you get more growth. Um, now, we've done this, and the, unfortunately, graphs, are, none of this is published, um, but the graphs for the, um, the other stuff uh, isn't ready yet. But we've looked to see if there's an optimum for fungi in the same way that there is for for almost every other organism on the planet have a, has an optimum diet preference, protein to carbohydrate. And they do, but fungi differ, differ from a lot of other organisms in that they have a very broad plateau. And then too low, not enough carbon, or not enough nitrogen on either end, they don't do so well. But they've got a very broad platform, at least a couple of species that we've looked at. So, interestingly, What's happening here is the efficiency with which, carbon, with which nutrients have been converted into growth is independent of whether it's organic or inorganic source, or the, therefore independent of the quality of the resource. But it's the stability of the system is very different. And we've now got a little um, computational model of the regulatory pathways of nitrogen and carbon, and, uh, the first one as far as we know, that can reproduce this. So it's something to do with the way that carbon and nitrogen are, are metabolized that's causing this, and we're still trying to figure this out. But at the end of the day, the efficiency, it looks like there's a, that, uh, so I always, uh, always look on, on nature as, as somehow dealing, trying to maximize productivity while maximizing efficiency and maximizing resilience. You can't do all of those things all at once. As a farmer, that's exactly what you want to do. You want to maximize productivity, but you don't want to compromise resilience or robustness to drought and stuff like that. And you want to maximize efficiency because you don't want to spend more than you have to, right? Microbes do exactly the same. And in this case, they're holding on to efficiency at the cost of resilience. So you get this big instability in the growth um, Tinkerbell. Oh, yeah, look, the, nah, you don't need to know that. that, that that's the uh, stuff. So, just finish this then. What is soil? Come back to this question, what is soil? Now, does anybody know what those things on the left are? Hmm? Yeah. And the things on the right are fossil stromatolites. So the ones on the left are in Shark Bay in, in Western Australia. The ones on the right are three and a half billion years old. Stromatolites. Right, I'm coming to that. Take your time. Now, <laughs> what you notice, is, and the reason that people and, and paleontologists figure out that, that that is a stromatolite is because when you cut through the rock, it's organized, right? It doesn't look like rock. It looks like some kind of organization has gone on in there. And there's a bit of debate about whether that's chemical or, or, or microbial, biological, until they did the same with the living stromatolites and you see exactly the same thing. So a stromatolite is like dinosaur soil. Long before there were plants, long before there was soil, when the earth was just covered in rock, there was a little blue-green algae that lived in warm, shallow seas. 
and it photosynthesized. It was the first plant. Now, if you're a photosynthesizing little person in shallow sea, the last thing you want is to get shaded out. And you get shaded out when sediment falls on top of you. So these things invented a clever mechanism by random chance and reinforcement through natural selection and all that stuff. The ones that produced a little bit of glue, they actually built little pillars and they raised their, their daughter cells higher than the sedimenting layer. And those ones survived better than the ones that didn't. And by gluing the sedimenting particles together and building these structures, so this is a gazillion billion of these things all gluing and fixing sedimenting particles together and rising above the, the layer of, of mud and stuff. This, I kind of think of this as the first soil. It's got a primitive plant in it and it's got primitive soil. It's a substrate, it's a very mineral rich um, sediment. Uh, so microbes have been doing, have been organizing their environment for three and a half billion years. In the same way that termites modify their environment, they build these big mounds and they build channels and pipes and things for cooling and they're actually farming in their, you know, farming fungus. And ecologists like to call the termite system they like to call it an extended phenotype. Now, phenotype is just, you know, you've heard of the genotype. That's the, this idea that we're defined by our genes, and we now know that's rubbish. Um, but anyway, even when we thought we were defined by our genes, um, our behavior was determined by the interaction of our genes with the environment. And that's called the phenotype. The phenotype is a product of environment and genotype. It doesn't make sense to think of a termite in isolation because it can't live or reproduce in isolation. And it's silly to think of a termite mound in isolation of the termites. The only sensible way to think of, about termites is the mound and the community of termites. So that's called an extended phenotype. So all the genes and all the stuff in there and the environment created by the, the mound is pretty close to being an organism in itself. So it's called an extended phenotype. And that's actually analogous to what soil is, but at a much smaller scale. You cannot think of soil microbes in isolation of the soil. In fact, you can't even get them to grow out of soil, most of them. You can't think of soil without microbes. That's called a beach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be anti-Western Australia. They have a hard enough time. Um, you can only think of them together. So, think of I, I, I'm increasingly thinking of soil as a kind of a, like a little, you know, a little termite mound thing. This coexistence of the physics and the biology together, and most importantly, the way they interact. So a termite mound is not a static thing, it's all the time being changed. You just look at a termite mound after it rains, all sorts of new excavations going on to change the humidity inside the termite mound. It's adaptive. Its capacity to adapt depends on a healthy microbial community. A healthy commu microbial community depends on what you're feeding your soil in exactly the same way, probably very exactly the same way that you feed yourself. So I'm working now with some people who are interested in gut. And you're, you know, there are more microbial cells in your body than human cells, and they're all in your gut. And the gut has a huge bearing on your health, um, mental health and physical health. Uh, and you can manipulate both of those things by, and more by choosing the right kind of diet. It's the same for soil. That's what I think soil is. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a question? We talk about uh, peak phosphorus and peak soil, uh, oil, I beg your pardon. Mm. Shouldn't we be talking about peak soil yeah. with your earlier comment? 
Yeah, so, so we, we got this group of people together and we've had a couple of, of summits, one in Washington and one in Sydney, on, on this concept of soil security. Just bringing, we're trying to raise the profile of the issue that soil is, is a living thing, first of all, and that it is also a finite resource and that we're losing it at a very scary rate. Now, I had a meeting for some reason, I can't remember why, with the um, Prime Minister and Cabinet security, head of security, the guy that stands between us and terrorism and everything. Really nice guy, Angus Campbell. He's now re leading the, um, the forces out in Afghanistan. Very nice guy, astronomer, as it turns out. So we got on very well. Uh, he's also special forces and huge hands and anyway. Um, he didn't get food security, so this is not an issue for Australia. Because he's a military guy, right? Is it a threat? Can you break his neck? No, right? It doesn't matter. Um, until I said, we've got 50 years of soil left. And it clicked. So all the time, you know what it's like? You try to find levers on politicians that you can pull and tweak and turn and to try and get them to pay attention. And that is an issue that raises concern amongst politicians. Uh, of course, in Australia, we've, you know, we've got quite a degraded soil because of the previous ideas of how it should be managed. Uh, we lost a lot of carbon. But globally, it's the same situation, particularly around areas with highest population density. And that's a major issue for global security. And now, of course, you could think of it, and it's probably a reasonable way to think of it, that the the guys who are now in charge of global security are looking at soil because it's food that's, and water, both of which are soil issues, actually. Um, if you get good soil, you, you, you use less water. Um, they're lo that, so they're looking at the, those kind of natural resource constraints as being the major trigger points for conflict. There's we'll time for Q&A afterwards, Are you isn't staying there? for question and answers mm. this afternoon? Mm. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. A big round of applause for John. That was Thank you.